WDBM East Lansing. Welcome to The Sci Files, an Impact 89 FM series focusing on student research here at Michigan State University. We're your co hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. Today, Danny and I are back at Potter Park Zoo to talk about Jali. Dopsy was pregnant a few months ago, and we had an episode about that. And now we're here for a follow up to hear what is it like to have a baby rhino here at the zoo. First, we're here talking to Dr. Ronan. Dr. Ronan, can you please tell us about what it's like having a baby rhino and how was the birth of Jolly? Well, we're very excited to have uh, Jolly at the zoo. It's a big achievement for the zoo. This is the, the first black rhino birth that we've had at the zoo in having rhinos for about 30 plus years. Uh, you know, black rhinos are critically endangered. There's less than probably 55 individuals in the AZA captive population. So each birth is uh, very critical. So the birth uh, went pretty smoothly. This was uh, Dopsy's first birth. Um, stage one lasted, um, which is when they start having contractions, that lasted probably about ooh, four or five hours, which is pretty normal. Um, and then stage two was pretty quick. It was probably less than 30 minutes, um, you know, from uh, the choreo allen toes being visible and, and rupturing and then um, the fetus feet coming out and the baby dropping to the floor happened pretty quickly and then uh, stage three which is the pl- uh, passage of the placenta that happened uh, within a couple hours so it was a very very smooth uh, birth I can say that like uh, in there are dystocia has been reported in, in rhino so that's a difficult birth um, the exact amounts and frequency that occurs for the different species isn't really known but um, some individual species seem to have a higher predilection things like uh, or species like the white rhino has a pretty high predilection Uh, the greater one horn rhino has a higher predilection like we commonly will see stillbirths in those species Um, black rhinos we don't know the exact number but um, you know we're always concerned about that as a possibility and we had plans in place to deal with any dystocias had we need to um, but again we were just very excited that she had a happy healthy calf her first time and that she's such a good mother she's a an exceptional mother and um, the baby was nursing within probably you know less than two hours and uh, we were able to get good video of that and um, the baby's been growing at an appropriate rate. He seems very healthy, and he has uh, a lot of the same personality traits as his mother. So he he's starting to bond really well with his keepers, um, and that's that's great from a veterinary point of view. If uh, the animal trusts the keepers, then we can often um, then they'll learn to trust me, and then I can um, you know be able to do medical procedures with the animal's uh, acceptance. Thanks, Dr. Ronan, for joining us today. When going through the process of determining whether or not Dopsy was going through labor, how can you tell what stage of the labor that she's in for the pregnancy? It seems like uh, it, it's really difficult to tell. It's not like when you're looking at a person and their water breaks, oh, okay, they're, they're about to start going into labor. But how does that work for a rhino with these different phases that you spoke about besides the obvious of the rhino actually giving birth. It is challenging to know if the animal is starting, if labor is starting to initiate um, in rhinos, particular because they are such large animals and they don't always show really obvious external signs. But Dopsy, um, things that we saw was that she started to um, lay down more. She lay, started to pace. She was more agitated. Um, and her um, some of her other behaviors, like usually she's very, um, she was a little bit more irritated, probably from discomfort. Um, so we actually, and black rhinos have a pretty, uh, like with their gestation period, like they can, it can range anywhere from 420 days to 480 days. And, you know, that that's just one reported number. There's, you know, individual variation. So this being her first pregnancy, we didn't know how long it would, she would be pregnant for before she would give birth. Um, so there were quite a few times where we were unsure if she was starting to go into labor. So people, staff would go in to check on her throughout the night. Um, and, and with this time she, she was doing very, she had acted this way before. So we weren't really sure if she was going into labor, but at, at one point, um, her, she did have a rupture of the fetal membranes and, and fluid came out and, and we knew that she started to go into labor, but there were definite, um, 
there were definite false false alarms where we would go in and we thought she was going to be starting to have labor and or go into labor, I should say. Um, but uh, yeah, but then once the actual labor started, uh, the process, um, like once we got into stage two, because there's different stages with parturition, um, once we got to stage two where the be- the fetal membranes had ruptured and there was leakage of the amniotic fluid, um, then the fetus came out very quickly. So. If I recall from our previous episode about Dopsy, that you had mentioned that there were research studies that she was involved with. Is Jolie involved in any research studies? I know it would be hard to research a baby rhino when the mother is so protective of the baby, but maybe you guys are able to do a few things on the side. Yeah, we're doing a couple research studies that Jolly is participating in. Um, so one, we're looking at... Uh, Indirectly, we're looking at the changes in milk composition throughout throughout lactation. So he's letting us uh, get milk from his mom, which is nice. Because uh, so, uh, and then we're submitting that to Smithsonian. They have a milk lab, and we're looking at seeing how protein and fat and uh, carbohydrates uh, change throughout uh, lactation. So that's important because say we say you're having to hand rear a black rhino calf. Um, it's important to make sure that the milk that you're giving the, the supplemental milk matches the mother's milk to minimize the chances that you're going to cause disease or uh, growth abnormalities in those rhinos. Also, um, Jolly, as well as Dopsy and uh, Finn, are also partaking in a, a, a fecal microbiome study. So we're collecting feces and we're looking at how um, what is the normal microbiome of a black rhino, and then also what is the how does the black uh, black rhino microbiome intestinal microbiome, I should say, changed throughout uh, lactation and pregnancy. Um, Also, we were able to uh, send the video of the birth, birthing process to another zoo that is collating all that information to sort of uh, be able to say how long does stage one or stage two or stage three last in a typical black rhino pregnancy, and that's very useful information to have. Uh, So you're collecting all of these samples to study how the rhino captivity is different from something like out in the wild what are some goals that you hope to accomplish with these research studies on a more specific scale yeah i mean in the ideal world um the data that we get in captivity if it can uh be utilized in the wild and help preserve these species and improve uh the likelihood that they'll persist that that's our goal and uh, we can collect a lot of data um, with captive rhinos that we wouldn't be able to c- collect feasibly in wild rhinos. So that's exciting for us as a, as a zoo and uh, as a whole zoo community when we can, um, you know, collect data on on these individual captive animals and then that information can help improve the success and the survivability of the wild populations. That's, that's really exciting. So, you know, then those rhinos in the zoo aren't just functioning as a captive assurance po- uh, population, but they're also helping their wild, wild rhino relatives. Well, I hope that these studies that you perform with Jali as well as Dopsy are able to help you promote these conservation efforts that Potter Park Zoo is trying to perform here for the rest of the world as well. And good luck with any other future research projects with Jali, Dr. Ronan. Okay, thanks very much. I appreciate you guys uh, coming out and doing these podcasts. Uh, you know, I'm a, I like listening to them and they're very interesting. And, you know, it's great to make this science uh, more um accessible by the general public and i think it's you guys are doing a really great job you know we're also joined by pat fountain he's the animal care supervisor here at potter park pat was here for when dopsy was giving birth and i would love to hear about that experience like what was it like when she was giving birth pat very early in the morning of christmas eve of this past year i received a phone call it was probably about 2 or two thirty in the morning um when I received a call from our overnight security who regularly checked the cameras and would give us updates if they were worried, if they thought they saw anything different. And this call was a little different than the others because the first thing he said is, I think her water broke. So I jumped out of bed and I ran into the zoo as fast as I could um, and got here in about 10 minutes or so. And after reviewing the tapes and sending some text messages and pictures to Dr. Ronan, we had concluded that her water had indeed broke. At this point in the husbandry manual, it suggests that we have between 10 to 12 hours before she actually gives birth. 
So I did end up going back home and I told the security again, you know, if she is pacing, if she looks restless, give me a call. Um, she had also charged me at the bars at 2.30 in the morning, which she hadn't done probably in six or seven years. So we knew that something was up and most likely she was going to be giving birth. Um, I sent an email at about three in the morning to all the keepers staff to let them know of the changes and to uh, let them know that they need to be a little more careful and cautious around her because she was feeling a little off. Uh, at five o'clock, just about right as I fell asleep on my couch just to not wake my whole family up, the next time I got a call, um, I got a call from overnight security again who informed me that something was coming out. He said, I don't know what's going on, but something's coming out. And I said, well, that's that's a baby. Uh, I'm on my way. So as I drove into the zoo and I called multiple people um, to let them know that it was time to come in and it was happening, I got to the barn right after Jolly had hit the ground and I watched him blink for the first time and take his first few breaths and pick his head up and look around. Uh, So it was a very special moment Um, and mom really did great. From what I can tell, the birthing process supposed to take about 10 to 12 hours after water breaks and then the actual active labor the manual says takes one to three hours it only took her about a half hour of active labor so she had a very quick birth Uh, the baby also came out backwards which was a bit of a concern going into this with the vet staff and dr ronan but it didn't seem to cause her any trouble at all so he came out leg first instead of head first which we didn't want to see But it was a little easier to see upon reviewing than in the moment. So it was nice to not have to stress about that in the exact moment. Um, But mom and baby were great from that moment on. It sounds like it was a pretty exhilarating experience to be able to witness this once-in-a-lifetime experience to see a black rhino give birth to a nice little calf. But as I would imagine... The mother is probably extremely protective, just like Chelsea had mentioned earlier in the episode. How long did it take for Dopsy to feel comfortable enough with you all to interact with Jolly in the first place? So Dopsy gave birth at about 5.40 or so in the morning. At this point, we had a tent set up outside the barn with a heater in it because it was Christmas Eve. It was a little cold out. And we had a TV moved out there so we could monitor her um, progression and how baby was doing while still giving her her space and making her comfortable. So we had about a dozen or so zoo members sitting out um, very excitedly watching what was going on. And at about 8 o'clock, when the keeper staff would normally go in the barn and things would get going, I went into the barn and turned the lights on just like a normal day so she could get kind of into a routine of what was going on. And she was very, very calm. She she allowed us to, to watch her to uh to observe the baby at that moment and then I was able to start feeding her treats and once I started feeding her treats I decided that that was a good time to have other people come in the barn and to observe the baby and so from about eight o'clock in the morning on she let us interact with her feeding her and be near the baby Uh, this was a huge moment for everyone involved obviously getting your uh, eyes on a on the baby, um, not just on the TV, but it was a completely different experience seeing him in person and seeing how he was interacting with mom. Thanks a lot for sharing that story, Pat. It must have been really amazing to be there that day and to see Jolly be born and to blink for the first time and everything. And I know that you have such a close connection to Adopsy, and it's really nice that she was able to share her space with you and welcome you. We're also joined by the keepers of the rhinos as well, Kim Hernandez, Adriana Davidson, and Murphy Schwartz. Can you all tell us about what it's like now to be around a baby rhino? What is it like having a baby rhino at the zoo? Hi, my name's Kim. I have been working with the rhinos for quite some time now, and this is the first time I've ever been able to work with a baby rhino. It's been definitely quite the experience watching him grow and build a relationship with us. Watching him through each of his milestones has been something very unique and different. And you see shows where you're growing up baby, and to be able to be a part of this and watch it in person and happen before you, to be able to actually touch this living animal, um, and to see 
him respond to you and recognize you and come up to you has been definitely a quite rewarding experience. Hi, I'm Adriana. Um, One of my favorite things about working with Jolly maybe isn't so favorite, but being able to work with the rhinos, um, cleaning the barn, basically you're not able to get anything done um, because you're so distracted by this adorable little rhino who just wants attention from you. Um, And then it's And then mom comes and walks up and she's fighting for attention too. Um, So that's probably one of my favorite things right now um, is just being able to work with both Dopsy and Jolly at the same time um, and just seeing how Jolly is just um, basically getting everything from mom. Mom trusts us keepers a lot and you can see that um, through Jolly as well. Hi, I'm Murphy. Uh, I'm a new hoofstock keeper here at Potter Park. I've only been here for about six months, and I knew Dopsy before coming in and started working here, and she was pregnant, which was amazing. And being part of the team that takes care of the baby rhino has been great. And I think my favorite part of the whole thing is that from day one, you see him start to grow a personality until now. Um the first few weeks, he really didn't want to come and interact with anybody. And we're to the point now where he comes to the bars just like his mom and begs for attention. It's great to hear how each of you play an integral part in the development of Jali as well as taking care of Dopsy. But that makes me think, between the keepers and Dopsy herself, who is the one that's actually taking care of Jali the most between anyone? And this question is open to anybody here. This is Kim. Um, Dopsy is the one doing most of the care for her baby. We come in and we monitor. We have a computer set up. We have cameras set in the stall so we can make sure that the baby is nursing and how frequent he's nursing and if he's urinating and defecating. And we can watch all this. Even though we're not there at night, we can watch everything that happened overnight in the morning. We still we care for Dopsy, and he's learning from mom. So mom eats hay, so he's learning to eat hay. We offer mom treats, so he comes up to us. And even though he's not necessarily, you know, taking treats from us, but we're, he's still coming up to us, and we're giving mom attention, we're giving baby attention. But in the end, mom's take mom's doing the primary, like, feeding for him, although he's learning, and he's learning through mom, and then learning how mom has a relationship with us and how we care for her, we're then indirectly caring for him as well. And right now, we're in the process of... One, we've been able to get a weight on him. So we, now we know exactly how much he weighs. And then two, you know, we have to work for uh, medical procedures like vaccines um, to make sure then he's getting the proper proper care and medical immunizations that he needs. But overall, mom's the primary caretaker. And then we're just making sure mom's doing her job and what she's doing a great job taking care of baby. So I don't really know much about raising a baby rhino. I could only really think about humans, really, about like how a human would be nursing from the mother for much longer than basically two months. And he's basically like almost two months old right now. And I'm surprised that he's eating solid food. Does he have teeth or like was he born with teeth? Is he teething? And is it okay that he's eating solid food so early? Hey, this is Adriana. Um, So rhino calves are born without teeth, uh, just like humans. Um, But as they grow, their teeth will come in. Um, So he did go through a teething process, and he probably still is teething. Um, He will be nursing from mom for could be anywhere between two to three years. It's basically just dependent on mom. And when mom is just like, hey, you're done. So... (laughs) Um, but it's perfectly normal for him to be eating solid foods. He's learning everything from mom. Um, so some of those behaviors such as using his prehensile lip, um, to grab onto those, um, treats as we were calling it, either that's produce, um, hay or the grain that we feed Dopsy. Um, so, um, he's moving at a steady growing pace right now. So So Jolly was born on December 24th back in 2019 and has been growing up with everyone here uh, in the Potter Park Zoo. And Kim had mentioned about these milestones that Jolly was going through and accomplishing as he's grown up. 
But what are these milestones? Why are they in place? Why are they actually important for monitoring how well Jolly is developing? Hey, it's Murphy. So the reason that the milestones are so important are the things that Jolly is, needs to do in a day or over the course of time with us or for bodily functions. So some of his big milestones, like the first one, of course, is nursing because he needs that to survive. And then the next milestones are bodily functions to make sure he's defecating or urinating. Um, these are just things so that the animal care stuff knows that we don't have to step in at any point um, to take over care if Dopsy wasn't being a good mom. These were the milestones we were looking for to make sure that there was no need for us to step in. Uh, there's also other milestones that Jolly's accomplished, and they're more fun ones or more, or they're for medical reasons for the vet staff. One of the milestones that we've accomplished with him is different enrichment items. Uh, we've done more soft enrichment items or things on the ground, so jolly balls, boomer balls, uh, cubes. So a boomer ball or a jolly ball, for people who don't know what it is, is a round ball. It's made of hard plastic. Sometimes they'll have holes in the sides so you can stick food into so one of the ones we give, Dopsy and Jolly, has holes in it, and we'll stick food items into it. And this is put into place to show if mom's teaching him how to do these things or if he's going to learn them on his own. Um, it's a new item for him when he first saw it. So food going into it, mom knows what to do. So she was moving it around with her prehensile lip, and Jolly soon followed after she finished eating all the food to push it around with his face as well. A couple other big milestones was Jolly coming up to the keeper staff like Dopsy does. Uh, I mentioned before that he really didn't do it before the last couple weeks, and now he comes up readily looking for treats or pets. Uh, he also eats some solid foods, not a lot. He'll eat and mouth on mom's food, uh, produce, or hay. And then the last big milestone we just accomplished this week was getting a weight on him, which took three keepers and a lot of time and patience to get him and mom comfortable with the scale and also be able to put the scale in with them. And hopefully, luckily, he did get onto the scale so we could successfully get a weight. One of the biggest uh, and most important things that we have to remember as a staff is anytime Jolly approaches us, we base everything we do on positive uh, reinforcement. So when he does approach us and we want to continue his behavior, we make sure we take the time to give him scratches. The rounds tend to be very uh, tactile reinforced where they seem to really enjoy the touching and the petting and the scratching. So we make sure we give him things that he wants so he'll come back again. And this is all very important for when we do things like get a weight. Um, part of the process of getting a weight is teaching baby and mom that it's okay to be separated for a minute so one of the keepers will walk Dopsy to a different stall and the other keeper will sit and scratch Jolly and make sure he's comfortable and as happy as we can help him be with mom not being right by his side this allowed us to introduce a scale to mom and to Jolly first by putting it in the hallway where mom could look at it but not touch it because she does get a little nervous about new things and then eventually holding it up to her so she could investigate it further to the point where mom walks to a different stall, the keeper set the scale into the stall with Jolly, and he actually climbed up on it on pretty much the first try. Um, that was a very exciting moment for all of us, um, and a pretty humorous moment when he wasn't sure how to get down from about a one-inch scale. Um, but it turns out that Jolly now weighs 84.5 kilograms, which is, he's a pretty big boy, um, outweighs most of us here, and uh, he is becoming a, a little tank a little tank of a rhino and he's just growing at a at an incredibly quick rate and learning things very quickly so it's very important that the keepers are consistent they're cons they're constantly reinforcing him and we are encouraging the good behaviors that we want to see from him so that we can do things like train him hopefully to the extent that we train his mom uh, in the future that's pretty large that's over 180 pounds wow so I know that Phineas, who's Jolly's father, is over here as well. How did he react when Jolly was born? Like, did he get to see him afterwards? Hi, this is Adriana. So Phineas was in, actually in a separate stall 
when Jolly was born. Um, he can't actually see uh, Jolly, um, but he can smell and hear him all the time. Um, black rhinos are solitary animals, meaning that they live by themselves in the wild. So it's either going to be dad on his own or mom and calf, um, and they only come together for breeding. Phineas sometimes reacts to Dopsy's hormones. Um, now that she is not pregnant anymore, um, she is cycling again. Um, so we can definitely tell a reaction from him when she's cycling. Um, he gets a little bit worked up. He's only got one thing on his mind, um, which is Dopsy. Um, sometimes you can see that Dopsy kind of buys into it. Um, there's a small window between the two stalls. Sometimes she likes to put her butt in the window and he's kind of on the other side. So... <laughs> that's cool that phineas is able to pick up on dopsy's cycle and her scent and everything what is the future for these rhinos now that jolly's been born the future for the rhinos here at potter park zoo depends largely on the breeding recommendations coming from the ssp or the species survival plan jolly will stay here for anywhere between two to four years um, mom can breed with dad again um, and can get a recommendation as early as two years. So at that point, the baby would have to be weaned, um, probably find a new home while mom and dad breed. Um, part of it is space requirements here at the zoo too. So we have room for two adult rhinos and a baby. But once baby grows up, uh, he takes up a lot of space too. That's uh, going to be another 3,000 pound animal here at the zoo. So he will need to have a new home to potentially breed on his own, or we will need to send out either mom or dad. So a lot of it depends on what we hear back from the Rhino SSP. But there is a potential for Dopsy and Phineas to breed again, and we do hope to be able to do it again. Well, Chelsea, I don't know about you, but I think this is a fitting way to conclude after talking about what the future of these rhinos will be, not only for Potter Park Zoo, but also for the rest of the world. Thank you to all of you for joining us today, for talking to us about what it's like been to have worked with Jolly, as well as Dopsy and Phineas, and how it's going to have major impacts on the zoo community, as well as conservation efforts in the near future. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, do you want to drink some beer brewed by scientists while playing arcade games? Then join us at the first anniversary of the Sci-Files at the Grid on Pi Day. At 6 p.m., we will be releasing a beer brewed at Sagatug Brewery called Diceros. The proceeds go to the black rhino mother, Dopsy, and her calf, Jali, from Potter Park Zoo at the Animal Health Program. It's going to be epic. You're going to get to hear interviewees from the Sci-Files give updates on their episodes, such as the doctors and zookeepers of the black rhinos. It's almost been a year of the Sci-Files. To celebrate the anniversary, we will be giving out prizes, too. See you at the grid on March 14th, also known as Pi Day.